You guys good? All right, so I would like to uh, bring Mr. Donnie Herman in. So, Mr. Donnie Herman is, um, I wouldn't say one of Milltown's oldest, but he's actually one of Milltown's, uh, one, of, one of the most uh, knowledgeable about the town itself. So, take a well, seat. That's very kind. We have some, that I hope I don't get <laughs> down. We have some water and turn it over to Mr. Herman. We're going we're gonna to save our questions to the end. Uh, in case anybody has any questions, all right? So, well, thank you very kindly. The Murrays had talked to me about a year ago about doing this, and uh, I think they're wonderful people. And I didn't think anybody cared anymore about these kind of things. I am honored to be here. I was a Troop 33 myself, scout. In the old Methodist church, I started as a Cub Scout in 67, 68. It seems like yesterday, 1967, 68. 18? <laughs> and then I want to thank my parents. God rest their souls. As you get older, you go through life. They taught me pride in the town and family bonding and unity, which I carry today, years after their death. So... Let's talk about Milltown, right? So how does Milltown become a pocket town in between the Brunswick's? In between East Brunswick and in between North Brunswick. So we're going to split it down the way it was back in 1889 when Myers Rubber first moved into North Brunswick. It was right there on the corner of Ford and North Main Street. And the border between North Brunswick and East Brunswick was the bridge. The bridge, so we're, at, I want to say the head station, but it's Speedway. You guys would know Speedway, right? That was the trolley barn. And you'd catch the trolley to get your goods to New Brunswick twice a day. Or you go to South River. South River is 304 years old. You go twice a day. If you miss the stagecoach, this is before Milltown now, remember. You got the old Golden Lion had, they had, they had the stagecoach. That was a trolley one. They had the stagecoach. And you could catch that once a day. So, 1895, you have the Couthals, the Perduns, the old, the old farmhouses, right? The old streets that you see, Couthal, Perdun, Lindstrom. You have them, they get together and they don't feel like with the Myers rubber on the corner of Ford, Maine, they don't feel like they're part of the North Brunswick. So they go to North Brunswick Township, and they go to their township government, and they have all the farmers, and my great-grandfather, Charles, you get to meet him a little tonight. And they say they don't feel like they're part of North Brunswick Township. They feel that they have their own identity with the, with the uh, rubber factory. After that meeting, they said, okay, you come back at the next meeting and we'll discuss what we're going to do about this. Now, it's not like council meetings of today where it's two weeks. It could be two months. It could be six months. But they did show back up, the, the, the Kuthos, the Perdons, all the four farmers. And my, my great-grandfather, Charles Herman. And they decided that that council meeting in North Brunswick, that yes, you're really on the outskirts of North Brunswick, and you're not part of the town. You have your own identity with Myers Rubber, not Michelin yet. So we're going to give you $2,400 to form your own government. They were excited. They came back. They said, oh, we're going to go over to East Brunswick. We're going to go borough government we're going to pick. We're going to go over to East Brunswick. We're going to ask them to give us the south side of town with the Golden Lions there, the stagecoach. And they said, okay, so they got they did the, they did the incorporation by 1896. The north side was formed. It was Milltown after Bergen's Mill. They went to East Brunswick and they said, can we take the south side? And East Brunswick said, absolutely not. We're not giving it to you. It's part of East Brunswick and you're not going to get it. Okay, so 
as this went on with the Myers rubber, 1896, 97, 98, by 1902, Michelin Tire Company decides they want a piece of the action from France. And now Myers Rubber was the very first rubber manufacturer in the United States of America. So they turned around and they made an offer and negotiating from 1902. By 1906, they buy Myers Rubber Michelin. So don't ever be confused. Myers was the original company. Michelin bought them out, the French <coughs> company. And then that's when they decided, okay, they bought it out. They owned the property from Ford Avenue to Reeve Avenue. And then that's when they put the water tower up because they wanted water for their company. That was 1906. Then they built the houses in 1906 from Ford Avenue to Reeve Avenue. And the, well, they have ranches, but we call them the cottages. The old time old timers call them the cottages, no disrespect. They were rented. You didn't own anything in there. The company, you rented it for the blue collar with the cottages and the up and down South Street and Clay Street. White collars with, had the up and down homes. Where the United Way is in there, that was the president and vice president of Michelin Tire Company. Where you guys sold your trees this year, that was the actual factory, that concrete slab there on the corner. That was it. So kind of, I sold my soul to the company store. They, uh, you, you maybe made $25 for the month. You had to pay your $10 rent for your home. You had the company store by the president's house on Ford Avenue, so you had to pick up goods for the family to eat. So by the end of the month, they go, well, you owe us $18, and you got $25, you know, here's your $7 that you, we're going to split even. So that was Myers Rubber. Michelin. So it's pretty exciting because they decided back then, I want you guys to think about it. 1907, they had outhouses in the backyards to go to the bathroom. We take it for granted. I do too. They're, I could go inside in my day too. Uh, and so Michelin thought, you know, we're going to have water in the house and bathrooms and we're going to provide something that has been going on for about 20 years for our factory workers. So that's when the water system was incorporated, not for Milltown, only for the factories. So they put the water tower in, and that, that old tower you guys see up top, 1907, it got finished. They started the water system, and the sewer went directly into the pond. They didn't know. There was no sewer authority to go to. And the people, the rest of the town was like, oh my God. Can you believe them Michelin people? They got it. It's six inches of snow outside last night, and I had to go out to the outhouse. <clears throat> but them Michelin people, they were inside. They have a bathroom and running water in the kitchen. Oh, my God, they're so fortunate over there on Ford Avenue and all in there. They were like the rave. It took seven years later, 1914, the borough of Milton then incorporated the water system for the rest of the town. But there wasn't much of a town. It was just growing, but the north side's older, it grew first, because it was incorporated. By, by the time Michelin bought it in 1906, Michelin said to East Brunswick when they bought it, now listen, East Brunswick, this little town here, this, where the trolley barn is, the south side, the, you know the guys know the old firehouse on the south side of town? That was a schoolhouse, elementary schoolhouse for East Brunswick originally. And they go, this is part of Milltown. And that's when finally East Brunswick caved and gave them the south side of town. Ten years later, so as I grew up as a kid, it was the north side, south side, because the north side had, they were almost built all the way up. They got more services because the south side was only a, not even halfway developed. Um, and, and the things that happened... After that, so, so I'll take you and we'll walk on Main Street. It's September 8th, it's 1900. Let's go in a time capsule and walk on Main Street. So we talked about the trolley barn, where the speedway is. So the tracks went right up the middle of Main Street both ways. On each side was dirt road, and it was about two and a half feet lower. Uh, where the vacuum store is, 
was a blacksmith. If you go into the basement there, it's pitched, to, he, he would wash the horses and it's pitched to the road in the basement still. And he'd shoe the horses right there. Um, the old Mason Lodge is uh, where you have the diner there, Meltdown Diner, that's 1889. That's a, that's a really old building. Um, my grandfather Charles, right? 1900, he had Herman's Bakery, which is Party Bliss. You guys see Party Bliss by the, by the eye doctor? That is where he had his, where he showcased his cakes and everything. And he was also the DMV. Vehicles were just starting to come into play a little bit, you know, electrical vehicles and stuff. But I take a little bit, a little step back with it in 1906 because, I mean, 19, September 8, 1900. And I tell you, sometimes the stories go up and down. So my grandfather, Charles, my great-grandfather, he liked to gamble a little bit. He had the bakery and he had an arranged marriage from Ida down in Philadelphia. So he liked to go across to the, well, it was Myers Rubber at the time, across the street. Now you guys know where Francesco's is. When you go past it the next time, look up top, you'll see a hint of what it was. It has to go, the, go, the building goes up and down like this, the original brick, and in the front was two doors. They also had entertainment for the employees. So they had two pool tables in there, they had two bowling alleys, a small movie theater, and then in the back downstairs was the cafeteria for the workers, and then the upstairs was the banquet room for the workers when they had big, you know, things that happened. So he's going to go over, he's telling me, I'm going to run over now, My, he had five kids. He's going to go across the street. He's going to do a little gambling. She goes, geez, you know, geez, Charles, what the heck? No, I'll be back right back. Right? It'll only take a couple minutes. So as he goes across Ford Main, and he looks in front of the old Milltown Diner, he sees a stagecoach there with four horses tied up. And he looks to the right, and, look, and, and he doesn't see anybody. He says, it's good to go. And not, many, not many people, not much traffic. So as he starts to walk across the street, the stagecoach gets spooked. And it starts to run. And he sees it coming, and he tries to get out of the way, and he runs to get out of the way. And the stagecoach goes over the top of four horses and the stagecoach, and he lays on the corner of Ford Main. And a couple people scream. There's not many people. Men, my great-grandmother come running out into the street. My grandfather lay there, and he told her he loved her, and he passed away in his arms that day, September 8th, 1900. So sometimes when I go past the street, I go, hey, great-grandpa, how you doing? I'm thinking about you today. So the, the time capsule, there's events and times that happen that you guys are living too. You go back to that day you can remember. So she loved him so much, my grandmother, that St. Paul's, the second church was built, you know, in front on, on Main Street. This is 24 years later, never remarried, had five kids already with him. My grandfather was two. And when they built St. Paul's, the stained glass window on the right is in memory of Charles Herman, her husband, and my great-grandfather. So it was a good tri tribute and a memory to him, his soul. Uh, we can go down to the French kids then. The French kids that didn't want to go to school and learn English. Believe it or not, they didn't. I don't know why. 189 is, a, is on North Main Street. It's by Borum Avenue. It was a law office is now closed up, and I don't know what's going in there yet. So that was from K to 8th grade. That was a French school for just the French children that didn't want to learn English. And that was a special school for them. The other kids went to the school in East Brunswick on the south side of town, became Milltown School House. It wasn't Joyce Kilmer yet. And in the back was the museum to the old firehouse was the actual firehouse. Um, Joyce Kilmer then was built in 1907. I'm all over the place. I'm pretty excited about Milltown. I hope you guys are excited about it also. Uh, it's not a town to me. It's a way of life. We look after each other, and we are going to fight with each other. Um, so now we get into the industrial league. So Michelin had an industrial baseball team. 
in Michelin. So Michelin Field, you guys know, you know, Michelin Field, right? It's kind of like a double A team. Triple A, I guess, is the highest. I always misconstrue that, but it's double A. And, well, yeah, you remember Charles Herman, right? He passed away on Main Street, my great grand. Well, his one son, he had four sons, but my grandfather, Carl, who I think the end of the world, God bless him, he was the catcher of the team. And they called him Sticker. Because he hit, he was a lefty, and he hit the home run over Sherman Avenue into the homes. And then my great uncle, his Ab Herman, he was a shortstop for the team. He was good. He was the only guy that I know so far in town that made the professional baseball league. Ab Herman, he played for the Boston Braves as a utility player, 1921 to 1922. So that so when the guys played your 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 industrial league, your factory team, remember there's no TV. There's not much to do, right? But you're going to walk to that Michelin field and you're going to watch them play your factory team. And they were pretty good, right? It had 3,500 bleacher seats. And then, just, you know, people go on their horse and buggies on a Saturday. That was the event of the day. So, you know, there was a big game coming up. And there was a team that was a traveling team. It was a triple-A team. They were ringers. But, you know, we thought in Meltdown, we're going to beat them. We're going to beat them. It was a team called the House of David. And you go on your computer and check the House of David. They traveled throughout the country. And they were going to play the Michelin All-Stars, our team, our factory team. We're going to get them. And everybody was excited, and the tickets sold out, and the kids were peeking through the fences with the homes on South Street, you know, peeking through because it was all wooden. They don't want you to see it. And we played the best game we could. We were a little outclassed like Casey at the plate. They beat us 7-2 to two that day. And they never came back to House of David. But one of the players for the House of David, according to my, my grandfather, to my father, was Casey Stangle played on that field against the Michelin team. So, that, I mean, it was pretty exciting to... I don't know if you guys know Casey Stangle out there. It's your grandfather's, maybe. He was a great ball player and then a, really a coach for the Yankees, the New York Yankees in their heyday, and then the Mets at the end. Um, as far as uh, Washington Avenue, so my grandfather had the bakery. And I, senior citizens, when I go in there, I feel like I'm six years old again, you know. Oh, Don, I remember you when you were this big, because it's a family milk town. It really is a family. You get to see it as you get older and you go through it. So what happened was my grandfather had Mr. Reeves. He'd take the wagon out and he'd deliver bread and stuff for the residents of Milltown. And he'd go up Washington Avenue, which they called the hill. If you think about it, it's the highest spot in Milltown. And it had, let me see, it had the Kuthaws, the Durst, the Kanelskis, the Funk family. And those farms up in there, during the Depression, it fed Milltown when we were all suffering. So Mr. Reeves goes up at 9 o'clock first thing in the morning. He goes up to Washington Avenue, the hill. And he's back around 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And my grandfather comes out into the yard, the right there on Main Street, you know, right there, you know, party bliss. What's up, Reeves? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, didn't you deliver to the hill? He says, yeah. He says, I delivered first thing in the morning. He goes, what are you doing? I'm reloading. He says, why are you reloading the bread and everything to go back up on the hill? He said, the people are hungry on the hill. And that's how that nickname, you guys don't know, but it was called Hungry Hill for two reasons. One, because he had to go back and get him more bread. And two, because they fed Milltown. So if you were hungry, you went to the hill and the farmers let you have whatever you needed. <laughs> Hungry Hill, and then you see the seniors. So, a lot of these stories, there's a couple people that are still around when I was a kid. Your guys' age, we guys ain't kids, but young men. George Geis, he's 95 years old, God bless him. He's good, best friends of my father. You have Al Dobrinsky, Doby, he's, uh, he's 90. Uh, he should be the Grand Marshal, in my opinion, of Milltown. He had Dobie's Sub Shop back in the day, three different locations. 
Um, what we did back in the day, we used to go sleigh riding, Milltown. So Milltown could do it back then. Used to take West Lincoln. See, West Lincoln is the only Lincoln Avenue as far as I'm concerned. East Lincoln wasn't around when I was a kid yet. That's where you had to go take a walk to get out of your mother's hair across Lincoln Main Street to get out of there. So they used to take the barrels on, Main, on West Lincoln and they blocked the roads. West Lincoln, they did JFK down to Ackerman. They did Moach Drive down to Janet. They'd block them all. And at nighttime, you'd have 40. The parents would come out sleigh riding, 40, 50 people sleigh riding at night. It was, a, it was a fun time. I mean, you got to know your neighbors and everything. And what a good, what a good, uh, what a good town. Um, Halloween, you guys have trunk or treat? Right? You guys had trunk or treat when you were kids, right? The trunks are open and maybe I'm wrong. But uh, what we had back then was Joyce Kilmer School was open and we had a Christmas, uh, we had, not Christmas, we had Halloween, a Halloween parade for the town. So the whole town would go and the kids would go and they'd parade and we'd go around in a circle and we'd walk. And then if you want, you got two silver dollars of the moon landing, JFK silver dollars. They were a big deal back then. And then after the kids were all done and they got different awards for different, then the parents got dressed up and then they went around at the parade too. Um, in that gym too, we'd also have uh, Saturday night movies. The whole town would go Saturday night to the gym and you can see a movie for a couple of hours. I guess again, they tried to get us out of our par parents' hair, I guess. Get some free time for them, I guess. Um, I just, there's just so much in my head. So many things have come back to me when I was asked by the Murrays. It's, it's good and bad, like a lot of memories from all these stories I'm telling you are real. But through the four generations, it's Thanksgiving parties and Christmas and New Year's through the years the family was always together. There was a story that they would tell about Milltown, and they were all so proud of the town that we were all brought up in, like on Herbert Avenue. The Previtt family, uh, he was the, got an Oscar for writing the song in fame, Tony Previtt's. So we have an Oscar winner in town. Uh, Gino Zimmerling from Van Lue Avenue played for the Atlanta Falcons. He's the best athlete I ever seen. He made pro football. He was, he played for uh, West Virginia College. Uh, we go the oldest house in town. And it's gonna kind of blows my mind. I've been I've been in all the houses. So I was meter read in 1990 after I got out of the Navy, and it's an amazing thing to get into the houses. So this is house number 269. It's the yellow house by the power lines where you have Milltown Automotive, and then the power lines, and then this yellow house on the bend by Perdon Avenue. So you think you're in Williamsburg, Virginia in that house. In the kitchen, they have a huge fireplace in the kitchen, because the original house was the kitchen, and that's it with a loft inside there. And it was built as far as they know to go back. God bless you. 18, I mean 16, 1680 and there's no deed to it, but that's as far back as they could trace that house so that house was sitting there in 1680 with nothing there was nothing here it was in the woods all by itself and uh, they then built the dining room off of it and then they built the front of the house the part and then the upstairs so it built in three pieces and that's the oldest house in town 1680 the reason it's not on the historical no one famous spent the night. I go, what the hell? There's a lot of milk that are spent the night there. <laughs> famous to me. Um, so that's the oldest house in town. And I'm going to set this up. People say that there was a, there's a movie. So there was a movie filmed in town, but it's, it was in, in early 1900s. It was, so before TV and all that, guys, you know, you got, you got it's a movie. So Every week you'd go for a nickel and you'd see your favorite show. So this one, I call it a TV movie. It was a, it was a series going on. It was The Powers of Pauline. 
And the perils of Pauline, if you guys go on YouTube tonight and you can go and see the perils of Pauline, she was tied to the tracks, the villain was tied her to the tracks, and the train's coming, and oh, you know, it's going to run her over, and this was the kind of thing that happened every time. But it was filmed in Milltown, and I don't know if you guys know where the 50-footer is, that's one of the wonders of Milltown. If you've ever been over to 50-footer, that's amazing. It was filmed there coming around by the, uh, the Four Brothers, Four Boys Pizza. It was filmed there. And then, I don't know who the Dudley was, the guy that saved her, but they did run a train off the tracks into the pond underneath. The stream down underneath. The Powers of Pauline. I looked on YouTube to try to identify that movie, but every time it's a stage, she's tied to the tracks every, every five minute clip every week. I don't know what, it doesn't say Milltown or whatever. But I will tell you, the train was physically removed. The uh, Army Corps of Engineers removed that for World War II for material. But there, so when people say there was a movie, yes, there was a movie here, but it was a weekly clip every five minutes that you went to a movie theater with five other clips, like a TV show, half hour, and you went and seen this show, and then the next week you want to see what happens and you go for another nickel for five more shows. So it's like early TV, but it was movies. Um, I don't know, so you guys have any questions or? I mean, I know I went a little fast. I got kind of a little excited about the town, and I love this town. Yes? So what about the Golden Lion and that whole era, um, that, uh, that corner of town there? When did that come into play? Because I know the Golden Lion is one of the, uh, from the early pictures, early photos you can see of Milltown, the Golden Lion has been there. Yeah, it was a hotel. The hotel, yeah. Right, and then from the Golden Lion, on a the corner there where the American Legion has their parking lot, there was a factory there. I'm not quite sure what that was. It burned in 1952 down to the ground. But you guys know where the, where the mill is, right? The condos? That is Ohio Playing Card. So that was a playing card factory. So in 1899. So the first floor they made the decks. The second floor they sorted them out. And the third floor was management. And they had a shift of employees there, and a couple hundred, so you wanted a job. And the fourth floor wasn't there. You would go there and get $6 a week or whatever it was. But Ohio Playing Cards was there, and they moved to Ohio. Ohio Playing Cards, they moved to Ohio. Up there, you got the freight station up there. You guys know where the freight station is? That's kind of like a UPS guy back in the 20s and up to the 50s. Before my time, um, so you order a package, you come over the rail, and then you get a call to go pick your package up at the freight station. They're trying to save that and move it across the street. Uh, the historical society, uh, no, when they, if it's when it's going to happen, I know they put a new roof on it to save it. It's a good question. Behind the old freight station was a barrel factory, and this story is from George Geis. He's still with us. 95, remember George. So he used to get a job. He got a job after he got out of high school, and he got a job at the barrel factory. So the barrel factory, they made wooden barrels back there, right behind the freight station, right along the tracks. And as he tells the story, he said there was a, there was a large black community worked in there. There was about 40 black guys, and there was about a couple, hand, a couple handful of kids in there to help out. And he said he was the number three ring. He put the third ring on the barrel. He was so proud about that, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Herm, I put the third ring on the, okay. And he says, but he goes, it was a funny place. He goes, we get the barrels all done. And then we roll them out to the tracks and stack them up and wait for the train. He goes, but the building was horrible. Now, if you think, it's behind the Little League building, the Little League field, that barrel company, right along the tracks. He said, you'd get six inches of snow. He said, you'd get more snow in the building than you had outside. It was horrible to work here. Yeah, so um, that was a barrel factory. There was, okay, we go to Chicopee. We go to Chicopee. So Chicopee was a great place. So it, not only was it Myers Rubber was the first rubber manufacturer in the United States of America. Chicopee had 
chickpea research. So they, they invented the disposable diaper and chickpea research. It was back in there. And then I don't know if you guys know flaco pie crust, you know pies that you eat? At flaco pie crust, a guy from New, New Brunswick came in and he started flaco pie crust out of that in building number 18, which is still half there towards the back, towards Sands Trucking. And that was an industrial hub. That was big time. That was a lot of, you know, a lot of job. You could get a job and go anywhere in town. You, got, you wanted work, it was you could go to the car factory, you go to the barrel factory, you go to Ford Avenue. It, it, it just was an industrial hub. No mill town down in here. That's a good question. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, when did the uh, borough pool like come into play? Great question. So the first borough pool. So that's a great question. Oh, you guys were involved. We were involved. The what's the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts? So that was a flood area. So the borough Mine's pool fun. originally down there was a pond. It's built on a pond. So the original pond, the Lions Club decided to decide to lock top that pond over so they pumped it out. But originally it was the pool was the pond with a little dock in the middle. It was before my time, believe it or not. But the stories that everyone tell me. And we used to throw chlorine tablets in there to keep it. You know, but there were snakes and turtles in there. Who cared? You were just getting wet, you know. They decided they're gonna make the borough pool. So in 1971, they pumped it out, they put pipes underneath it, and they blacktopped it, and we painted it blue. And, and you would walk down like it was the pond, and they filled it up like it was a pond. Mm -hmm. And then I believe it was 1990 or 1992, that it couldn't be salvaged anymore, and then they put the new pool in there. But that pool has oh, pipes yeah. underneath it because it fills up with water because it's a pond underneath it. When you guys go to the pool, you ever see that great where the, we just took the tree down over there in the driveway, you hear running water and all that? Yeah. That's pumped in streams underneath there, go through there, pumped in streams. But in 1971, when we were doing the pool, they called on the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts to help the public works. So on a Saturday and Sunday, we all town got together and they were, the public works employees were down there with loaders and we were all picking up big boulders and rocks and putting them in the payloaders so we could make that make that park make it a feasible park and a diamonds and football field and had the rangers down there and but the boy scouts were there too and the girl scouts that's a great question thank you and i believe they actually used to shoot water balloons over mill pond uh, uh, over the uh, pool from oh, yeah. one end to the other uh with a uh a Slingshot. Slingshot device. They did? Uh, during we, the summer months. We we used to have uh, our scout, Cub Scout, you know, picnics there every year. We did that. We had the zip line <coughs> from across, the, if you remember from the big tree that you see by the old fence, and went down all the ways to, you know, we keep the basketball on the corner there, guys? There was one that was bolted in there, and we had a zip line from the tree to there, and all our Cub Scouts used to up, go down the zip line. Like Mr. Murray was saying, we used to have, like I'm sure Dom remembers this too, um, the, uh, the, the slingshot with the balloons, you know, things like that. We did some other fun things that you probably can't get away with doing anymore, but we had a lot of fun there. <laughs> it was a different time. Yeah, I, I, you know what? It was a great experience, and I'm glad we can talk about it. But, but there are still some things that are being done that were done then. Yep. Santa Claus coming around on the fire truck. It's still being done. It was done 50, 60 years ago, and it's still being done. The old customs hanging are hung on to still. And I, I, I don't know, I'm 59, I still think it's pretty cool, Santa coming in the truck. I know the boys, hey, you guys, how you doing, you know? Um, what I'm saying is, Milltown is, to me, is not just a town, it, it's a way of life, it's, uh, it's a family, it's, uh, it's something important. Um, I mean, I went in the Navy and I was gone for four years. I couldn't wait to get back and uh, pick up where I left off. Um, and I want to thank my parents again for, uh, and the Cup, and the, and the cup Boy Scouts, Cup, well, cup Scouts, we both and then Boy Scouts uh, make me feel proud of my town and understand it. And I've worked for the town. I've been fortunate. You guys maybe see me out in the streets, water and sore for uh, 37 total years. 
And so still, what, still what's help? your function now, Mr. Hunter? That's I was just going to ask him. I'm supervisor of Motown Water and Sewer Department. What does that encompass? It encompasses the responsibility of all of structure of 85 miles of water line and sewer line and all the sewer stations and water stations functioning and getting water to every single resident every day. Uh, and, but I'm very fortunate. Uh, a high school education and the town of Milltown took me in and I worked my way up and it still could be that way here for that kind of work. Uh, very fortunate. But I just love the old areas. I love the old streets. The Lafayettes, the old neighborhoods, but I was a West Lincoln boy, you know, West Lincoln Avenue. Mm -hmm. I was a South Side boy. Yeah, they don't have that anymore. And that's all one now. You were a South Side boy too. You to... So, Mr. Murray, we call, but they used to call us Miltonians. Now they call us Millbillies. We don't care. So, Mr. Murray's an extreme Millbilly. <laughs> <laughs> He it, was brought up in that house and he bought it. He's living in it. He's an extreme milk belly. <laughs> My sister's an extreme milk belly. Um, People like that. Any other questions that I can help you with? Yes. How long was the trolley in town? The trolley was in town. They just took the tracks out. They were just taking them out. The last time they did, they took more. So it was in the town like 1889 to like 1930s until it went out of fashion. The cars were coming. It just wasn't needed anymore. But the trolley barn on the corner of Maine went all the way back to the post office. You know where the post office is? It went all the way back to there to where the old tracks used to come across. You guys know the trolley that's on Main Street Bridge? Are you guys stand, have you stood on the bridge and you see that pipe that comes out? And there's a reason for that pipe that comes out. That pipe had an elbow that went down into the water and it's got on that platform there, do you see a piece of, there's a, there's a valve there? That was for their fire suppression for the trolley barn. So if there was a fire, which there was an explosion in a fire in that building at one point, because I started for the borough in 1980, 81 as an employee, and I had an old guy, Hawkeye, was down there with a metal detector. I go, what you doing? Now there was an explosion. They had Indian heads down here. They're about six inches underneath the ground. I go, yeah, he's an old head. he know? And then he got a couple hits. He came back after lunch with a half a dozen Indian head pennies on the stream there. I go, oh, so I got some things I got to learn here before I start thinking I know it all. I'm only 19, you know, or 18. But that's, that's a good question. That was, went out in the mid, in mid the mid-30s got done. And then Michelin moved back to France around 1939-1940, which is kind of really surprising because they were occupied by Germany at the time. But they didn't have the materials to get over here to, to stay in business. They went back and then all their homes on Ford Avenue to Reeve Avenue, they said to the people in them, okay, well, you either buy them or we're selling them. You can buy them if you're in it, but we're going to sell And that's when they chopped it all up. But they went back to, to France. Now, on, Michelin has a, has, a, has a museum in France. And on the fourth floor of that museum in France, it's all dedicated to their time when they were in Milltown. Because the streets, you know, you got Sherman, you got Foch, and Petain, and Haig and Lafayette, all French generals. The French, it was a French company. So it's a big French town. Yeah. And not any other questions? Yes, sir. Is there a, you know where the Mill Pond uh, tra uh, Trail is now? You know, you can walk along there, it's very nice and whatnot. Was there, were there train tracks up Good. there? Good. Yes, one sir. Point? There yes, were, sir. right? There was. There was another siding that came mm -hmm. off of the. Right. There was the two spurs, you know where the borough garage is now behind the Little League? I know that one. That came off and that came down around the borough building there by the post office and it came to Main Street. Right. And the other one went into the, where the American Legion is okay. and it went in between the Golden Lion and then the Amico Station yeah. and it went 
where it used to be the Meltdown Tavern, now it's in, uh, I guess it's a Spanish restaurant. And went through the tracks through there, all the way to Freed's, was, they did so, the super fun site. So that went from, that went into East Brunswick then? In the yes, yep. yes. Okay, all right. <clears throat> how long, how long was that, when did they take that up? When was that removed? Yeah, when I was a kid, so I that was... there for a long time, right? Yeah, it was, but it was not running for... I mean, in the late 60s, I remember the tracks walking back in the woods there, but the train hadn't been going through there, but the tracks were still there, remnants of Okay. Right. In the early 90s, the borough decided to do the river walk, and it was great. They had the tracks and stuff and in there. the roadbed. Was, and did they find any artifacts back there when they were building that? I mean, no, but... Unfortunately, what we did was, when I worked for the borough back in 82, we would always dump asphalt and concrete back in the woods. Nobody's going to care. Just dump that when we do road work. Just go dump it and go dump it. And then came 1991, and they're like, oh, crap, we got to clean that up to make a river walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was all free. Oh, so that went to free. Okay. And do you, what, did, what did they make at Freed Industries? Soap. Soap. But it became a happy highway with 55-gallon drums. He was allowing people to dump back in there. Okay. He'd get a handful of money. Mm -hmm. and, and then that front pond there by Freed's, mm -hmm. Fresh Pond, it was sand, too. He was then, That was a sand pit there at one time. They'd get sand out of there, make concrete and things, sand. Mm -hmm. That's why that's there. They didn't know Laxaby have their archery range back there? Over yes. The too? And then there was a little dump site there, too, by the rangers, too. Interesting. My neighbor, um, he, uh, he actually worked there. He told me a little bit about it, but he, um, it was Ted Blumig. I don't know if you remember oh, I know Ted Blumig very well. So, he, you know, he, he's, he told some funny stories. He said that it got pretty wild back there. He said it was a free-for-all. That's why they ended up getting in a lot of trouble with the uh, EPA. It was, it, it was, and then, well, I don't know, I, Superfund site got cleaned up. I think East Brunswick wanted to connect our river walk to there, and we didn't want to do that. Uh, we want to keep our thing over here, and you keep your thing over there. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. No, but it's like you're connected by the ground anyway. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Yeah, oh, go ahead. When was the Park Hue? area developed and turned into the school? So Parkview School, I was the second class, I think, at Parkview's 1968. Uh, and so Joyce Kilmer, is, the old Joyce Kilmer was 1907. So when the main street, you see you got the firehouse on the south side of town, right? And the town was growing too much. And then after the East Project gave us the south side of town, that became the school for Meltowners, right? Okay, that's great. It's a schoolhouse, and if you're looking, if we're looking at the front of it, the bay to the right, take that out of there, right? And if you, and if you get a chance to get in there, I hope Mr. Murray or Miss Louise can get you guys in there. The bay to the left, so they filled in the basement to make that garage to make that a firehouse. So 1889. So the bay to the left, not the right that was added on. That's nonsense. Right, the front door. You get in there. The classroom blackboards are still in there. The firemen left them in place. And you can see where they filled it up and the, the chair railing is still in there. So if you get in there and see, you guys can get in there, I'd love you to get in there. You gotta work on that, George. Uh, you can get in and see the old schoolhouse. And then you go upstairs and then there's the classrooms upstairs too. That was also, and then came the 1907 Joyce Kilmer, after the poet in New Brunswick, he died during World War One, and he was a, so we had fond memories of. He wrote the, the poem, the tree. If you've ever read that, that's an amazing poem. I mean, of a tree. It's, so they named it Joyce Kilmer after him, 1907, and then 1980 it was out of play. It got old, and they knocked it down in one year. Left the gym was in 1952. And then the eighth grade win was in the back in the 50s too. And they, re they rebuilt that school this one summer. They knocked it down and had it ready for school the next, the same year, 1980. And I was like the second to last class out of there. But yeah, so, and then they built 
but in between they built 1968 they built um, they had to build Parkview so if you were on the south side of town you were kindergarten through fourth grade was in Parkview and then on the north side of town Joyce Cumber was fourth through eighth we never had a high school no, so enough. way back in the day the kids <clears throat> in the 50s and 60s you could either go to South River High School in Brunswick or you could go to New Brunswick and then the country ran into some serious problems it was about to happen in, in the 70s with riots and in the 60s and then Spots was building a high school and we were no longer going to South River and we were having New Brunswick was having turbulent times with riots and that's when we went to uh, Spots with high school we never did have a high school but I think we're the majority of the body of students over there anyway. With Spotswood and Helmeta, uh, you know, Jamesburg, I think, is in there too, no, I think. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Anything, any other questions? Okay. Yes. When did the railroad start? The railroad? Let me think. Yeah, it came through town here? Mm -hmm. Well, the one that's up on Washington Avenue, you know that runs twice a week. Mm-hmm. That's still, that's still, that's Browns, Brownsville. That goes to, that goes to, that goes to the uh, Silver Line, which is the 50 footer. It still uses it twice a week. And it takes pellets there to make the plastic replacement windows. But that was, uh, that had to be like the early 1900s. Yep. Yeah. But it's still in, it's still functioning. For four 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 trains a day go for for the plastic. Yeah, the old short line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the other ones were earlier. I mean, when you're talking about the buildings in Michelin, so Myers Rubber that was uh, building eighty nine, and then there's building two, but they're all down now. But two was nineteen oh eighty nine was eighteen eighty nine. Building two was nineteen oh two. Not not too much originality. Building three was 1903. Building five was 1905. Building seven, nine, 11, and 12, so on and so forth, 18. And buildings now in the back, 60, with 1960 and 68, is, is the end of 1960. So right now we have, a, we have a paper company down in there in the back, and we have Sands Trucking. And, but it, that was an amazing place at one time. And then, oh, I gotta mention this family, the Carrasso's. No, the Car yeah, the Carrasso's had a luncheonette on Ford Avenue for the factories. And everybody in Milltown would get together at the Carrasso's luncheonette. And of course, Russ, you know, Tuesdays was hot dogs day, chili dog steaks. days. Tuesday oh, chip it, steaks. It was the best. And then all the Milltown's in there and everybody's happy. Could have chewed each other out the day before, but we're all happy. We're, everybody's happy with the Carrasso family. And they're and the grandkids are still in town. They're still they're still here. Um, I said I was fourth generation, but there are families that are nine generations back to Kuthos. And Stacy Waters is nine generations. You know, it's amazing to know that I'm a carpetbagger there. So what I do when people come into town, I tease them a little bit. I got a sense of humor, I got to tease them. So I want them to know that they're part of something special is what I want them to know without saying it. Oh, you know, Don, we're Milltown now, we're Milltowners. And I go, where are you from? Staten Island or Woodbridge or wherever. I go, just, we're newly married, we got a house, we got this, we got that. That's great. I go, but you're, you're not a Milltowner yet. What do you mean? Your offspring will be mill towners, but you're still carpet baggers. <laughs> what do you mean we're carpet baggers? Well, you gotta live here 40 years. That works if you go on the South River, that works if you go on the East Project or North Project. You gotta be 40 years in a town, and then you become, you become a millbilly. They, they call us millbillies now. And they go, why 40 years, Don? I go, that's a simple one. Not only are you proving you're gonna live with us, you prove you're going to die with us, then you're a mill guy. <laughs> so, any other questions? Uh, yes, young man. Uh, was that was Michigan Field the only baseball field 
um, until Borough Park was developed and the pool was redone? Hey, great question. Yeah, it's, it was the only ball field. And it was named for Michelin because of the Michelin tires. And they owned the property, too, so I guess they could do whatever they wanted. Yeah, but that was the only ball field. It originally, before the house <coughs> were built, it was where the home plate is still in the area. Sometimes there are some people that go out there and pick up dirt and stuff because of KC Stangle. Went into, it went into Church Street. It went into Church Street, and then it went over Sherman Avenue before them houses were built. But when I was a kid, I think George was, maybe it was 420 to center field. There was no swings or nothing in there. 420 feet was deeper than Yankee Stadium. You couldn't hit it out. But it was the only ball field, yeah. But there was, where Borough Hall sits now, they had an Eagle Club that played football. And there was a little football field where Borough Hall sits on Washington Avenue now in front of the Brookside Swim Club. And they played football there. <clears throat> That's a great question. Thank you. Hey. Anybody else have? Yes. You, I've got you behind first. You want to go oh, first? Okay. Um, how come we have uh, two funeral homes in town? I guess the business is good. <laughs> <laughs> That was the best. No, uh, that's a great question. That's a, I, I don't, you know, I can't. I'm going to talk to, we have to Paul and John hear this. I can't really answer that, but, and I don't want to, I, listen, it's kind of funny because the funeral parlor way back Bronson, and I'm going to say it because what the heck is true. He was a Republican fella. And then Craybill was a Democratic fella. <clears throat> so I guess the birds, when they die, flock together. The Re Democrats wanted to go to the Democrats, and the Republicans want to be laid down by the, the Republicans. Old school, yeah. But uh, I guess there's enough business. But, but now they're, uh, they're kind of still the same, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed a lot, but different. So when I go, I'll be laid out one day in Craybills, and then the next day in Bronson to be buried, and nobody know what the hell I was. <laughs> Great question, though. How about you again, young man? When was the rescue squad put there? Oh my, that's you know that's a that's dear to my heart, them folks. <coughs> and the fire department and the rescue squad was uh, it's like the fifties, but it's it's an organization that's independent. So uh, they go for their fun drives every year. And um, and they're they're free. They do it for free, and so it's the fifties. It was there, but before then, but it was in that spot in the fifties. If you look at the front of it, the bay was the two bays in the front. Before you get the third bay to the side, that was the original building, and then it was added onto. Yeah. And from what the rescue squad members told me, was the reason they added onto it. They thought maybe the county was going to go and would have funded squad and they wanted to be ahead of the curve that they'd have room and board upstairs and you could sleep and and, and be have a full time but it was like the 50s but it was used when we had I don't know if you guys remember the power went out in town during Irene and Sandy that was one of the harder, harder nights for me here working for the town knowing that we were losing the battle that's when you were my boss and we were, we had to shut the town down to save the substation. And we knew that there was hundreds of houses that would not have pumps for their sub pumps for their homes. And we knew that there were people that needed, you know, electric and heat. And anyway, so we had gotten, I didn't, the, the borough council and them got back at those two storms, got Lyman come up from Tennessee. And there was no power, but they had the generator. And we got to use that for the six line crews come up and we got the power back the second time quicker. The first time, the year before we lost the station, was under three feet of water. It took a week for us to clean that up. 16 on and eight off. Um, but the second year we were, we were fortunate with just the winds. And so uh, they were able to sleep though up in the rescue squad. The, the rescues, we were family. When you're in trouble, 
you help each other out, you know. So that was, uh, and the squad members and the fire department, uh, whatever we need. I mean, there's no, what we're lucky to have them, organizations that are volunteer. It's hard to find them anymore. Towns are going to more paid. It's just a couple guys paid and not in old town. We're still hanging. And it's like it's 1950 and we don't have a problem with that in town. It's 1950 and we like it. <laughs> you know. Your turn again. Was it your turn again? No, anybody else got a question? I didn't go first. How many times did the borough uh, buildings over there in the low area flood from storms that you, you know. can recall? Oh my God, the garage, <laughs> the old garage? Oh my God. I was there. So that, that, so okay. So you guys don't know the old borough hall, but your folks might. They were kids. Well, I know you were here. You're an extreme mill belly. <laughs> So the old borough hall is in the driveway of where the borough hall is now. And we weren't thinking too smart. We were storing stuff in the attic. And it got too heavy. And it collapsed and, and down on the rest of the building. We lost a lot of paperwork and stuff in there because it had to be thrown out. You know. So the the, the new borough building then got built eventually, and the, but the but the garage was built in 1967 in the back so it would be two or three times a year we'd get a foot we'd have parties back there we'd eat lunch and stuff in three feet of water after we got all the vehicles out of there what the hell <laughs> but uh, it, it flooded a lot so we would always you know how your parents maybe had a, a doorway that you'd mark charts where you were growing when we had storms, we'd had a date by the doors. We'd have the storms, how high they got. <laughs> Until we had San they was it Sandy or Irene? Was it, Irene was the water, right? Yeah. That was six feet of water down there. We were out of that building for three days. We had to work out of the Four Boys Pizza right there in the lot. And we just went to work there and we worked out of there. But finally, we're out of a floodplain. That was, but it didn't flood like that. It was, uh, all the way up to Cranberry, they built it up over the years, and the, it came down. There's there's seven uh, dams, and over the years of overbuilding it, before they made drainage where you had drives, where you had sores going into retaining ponds, it went directly into the water. So every time the storm got more building, more pavement, less and less saturation in the ground, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse, and plus. We filled in, Washington Avenue was about six feet down where the borough lot is, and the back garage was about six feet down of punks and everything. And we thought we were smart, we'd fill it in and just put stuff there. Well, it didn't work, it, that, the, just the channel is so tight now, when it comes down from up to Farrington down, it's just too tight. And then add the beaver problem that we have, <coughs> the beavers are causing ha havoc down on North Southbrook Drive. It's a problem. Any other questions? Can I tell you something? Mr. Hearn? Yes. So I remember, for you guys don't know, that between my careers about 12, uh, 13 years ago or so, I worked for the borough for a while doing meter reading. And guess who my uh, boss was? The guy sitting in front of you. So this gentleman here, you would not know, you'd think it's really easy to read a meter and things like that, first of all. It takes a little practice to know how to read the dials and the old-fashioned meters like Don taught me. But Mr. Herman also showed me, like, I had the opportunity to go to every single structure in Milltown at one time or another over the course of a year and a half that yeah. I worked there. And that's what Mr. Herman can tell you, forget about the hour we spent today, he can spend another five hours telling you the things that you see in the buildings in Milltown, in the basements, and the stories, inside the old Ford Avenue buildings, what they actually look like, why they need to come down. But you learn so much just walking around town. You guys are scouts, you do a lot of hiking, a lot of walking, and things like that. But one of the things you learn is that there's a lot of wonderful people in town. There are so many people in town, and Mr. Herman will vouch for this, it's like, you know, they're not going to be home. They said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll leave the basement door open for you, you know, this. And they didn't care. This is Milltown. You know, they, they, they left things open. They let us do it. What's a while you didn't like a German Shepherd or two, right, Mr. Herman? And the keys. They left the keys. <laughs> they left the keys in the spot. They totally trusted us like you wouldn't believe. And it's just, 
nice to live in a town we can do that, right? Yes. And, and he still to this day has people that give him like special, him and, and the rest of the staff, they're like special Christmas gifts, leave them things, do things, leave cookies, milk, all kinds of stuff for them. I mean, it's really wonderful. And it, it's a type of small town feeling. But Mr. Herman, here's a question I was going to ask you though. Here's a question to this. Do you know approximately, not when, but how and why a little bit more about how we ended up having our own water and electric versus all the other towns around us. Why we didn't switch way back then and go with big companies yeah. back then. What's the reasoning? People ask that all the time. Yeah. I know you know. So, we've always different. looked at South River <coughs> as a model of us. So South River has 5,400 properties. Milltown has 3,000 property structures. South River had electric before us. And they were making money. You know, around the 1930s, Jack Coffey was the first superintendent of the electric department. And uh, he, we decided to then take over. The original substation uh, was up there by the power lines, where there's two new homes that are across from Milton Convenience and Our Lady of Lords, and two new homes, 150, I think, and 152. Yep, South. That's North. where the original substation power was. And so we built it there, and we took it over. And now you got to remember, there was probably, oh my God, probably maybe 100 or 200 houses. And then as it grew, they plant the poles, and, and then the phone company plant the poles, Ma Bell at the time. She was a monopoly. And then they just add the power, and a couple, another street was going in, add the power lines on that street, and it grew and it grew. So then the Meltdown would charge a little bit more It'd still be cheaper than PSC and G, but then they'd make money. So, in the state of New Jersey, so it was really because of South River. We saw how it was working for them. I don't know if somebody knew somebody over there, but the state of New Jersey, there are only 10 towns that distribute their own electricity, and you're sitting in one of them. <clears throat> and after Irene, because we become a priority, and so did South River, that they had to get the power to us as quick as they can, PSE and G, because they wanted to be able to say we got 3,000 properties off and they'd have to do a darn thing. We got power to the substation. We're good. They have 3,000 people. South River, you know, 5,000, they got 15,000 people, but 5,400 properties. They're a little bit bigger than us. So, yeah, it was due to South River. Due to South River, we, did, we built our own electric company. And water. And you guys own your power company, Meltdown Electric. And I started there with the crew, and then I ended up with the water and sewer, too, we did. Just the last two years, the town split us, and um, I guess they figure I'm getting old. They don't want me in a bucket. It might not be able to hold me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but uh, I'm in the water and sewer now, and then there's a crew over in the electric. But if they need a hand, I'm going to go help them. That's what we do here. You, you don't just turn your back. Somebody's got power out. Yeah, you got a free minute. Well, yeah, I'll be right over. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's because of South River. Mr. Herman, how'd they end up getting water from uh, New Brunswick? How did that happen? So that was New Brunswick water started in 1879, and so Michelin, 1906, right, and then. I don't know whether they got it from the stream. I don't know how they did that water. But we got water from two places. You're going to love this. Great question. So you know Craigville Park. Mm -hmm. So they got it from New Brunswick. And that was in 1914. They put a 12-inch force main. You ever see the you know, reruns of Petticoat Junction? I swear that's Milltown. If you ever watch Petticoat <laughs> Junction, that was Milltown back in the day when we were kids, you know? You go into the pond swimming, you just get the suckers, you know, the leeches off you, the little <laughs> fresh water leeches. Who cares, you know, we're going to have fun. We get wet. Mom will yell, but she'll get over it. So they, they, had, the, they had a water tower, a wooden water tower there, like Petticoat Junction, over there at Craigville Park for the 1914 when Meltdown did their rest of the town. But then we didn't have it for the south side. So you know the borough pool. You know the bathrooms. Mm -hmm. That was the ground where they got the groundwater out by that pond. And groundwater is better. You don't have to treat it. 
So we're doing a relining seven years ago, and you always find stuff out that you don't know, and it's not on the maps, because I find it out all the time. And I knew it was a, gra it was a ground water station for the south side of town. And I go, they go, Don, you realize you got a 10-inch water line still charged underneath going to the, to the old bathroom? I go, why? Oh, it's feeding, it's feeding it water to the bathroom. I go, Jesus, I thought it was all disconnected. <laughs> and the hydrant that's here, it's not connected to the main, it's to back. In, uh, so we had to do all this extra work and go be to, before the council. Could we, could, I don't want to explain how there's a 10 inch water main blowing the pool apart if it ever breaks. And that was connected to New Brunswick? Uh, that was, that was Milltown alone, oh, that part. And then the water tower was on by Crayville mm -hmm. Park was the north side and that took care of the south side. And that that state that's sort of still there, that where the line comes in, it's over by the park there, right? And that line was disconnected in nineteen ninety. It's still there but we put a twenty inch line we, the town put a twenty inch line in in nineteen ninety, still going through Cook, going through Squib in front of the park, underneath one by by the bridge one. there. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and we, we still do mark outs there, but that's a 20-inch. 20 20-inch. 20 yeah, so that's, that's good. And that only feeds the south side of town? That, no, that feeds the whole town now. The whole town now? Yeah, the 20-inch feeds okay. the whole town. Mm -hmm. But now you have the 10-inch, there's a 12-inch that comes in off of Elkins Lane that goes behind the houses that go to the dead end of Herbert, Silver Line, the back there underneath the 50-footer guys. And it goes underneath Moach Drive and it comes up to Washington to help the chlorine and feed the hill on the south side. Right. And it also goes through Main Street has a 10 inch line. <laughs> so it's like a big tree branch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. It's amazing. Crazy. But our water tower we have now by the Home Depot, 750,000 gallons. And that's a day and a half of water for Meltdown. You have to have that. And we have 200 connections two with North Brunswick, and one with East Brunswick at 10 inch by the Grove. So if we ever run into trouble, which we have during Irene, right. and I had to go to the council and say, we're in trouble, and can we, you know, emergency management hook up? Yeah, whatever we gotta do, and then East Brunswick is, it's a handshake, you, you, you people need water. We'll, we'll worry about the money later. Right, right. We, but we've used them. Yeah. Thank you, interesting. And Correct me if I'm wrong, but the fire department in an emergency, they still draw water out of Lawrence Brook in a big emergency they ever right. needed for a big fire. They still do that. All our trucks are equipped to do that, or our apparatus, right? Correct, correct. Yes. Anything else? Looking ahead to the future, what do you think could be implemented to preserve and educate residents about the Schwindemann cabin and the oh, Schwindemann like properties? That's a great question. That's a, that's a great question because uh, I knew them personally through my father. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Swinderman had the taxidermy store on Main Street, just still there, the remnants of it. Um, and they lived, God, she lived to 99, her and old lady Carrasso. We thought they were both 99 and we thought they were going to make 100 and they both died in six months. But um, so she would be down there. So that log cabin, to me, is a historical site to the fact that the Swindermans hand dug that pond, both ponds. We filled in the one pond that they wanted it filled in, Mrs. Swinderman, but they hand dug it. And she told us a story. My father and I would go down and visit her and bring her food she, when she got older. And I was you know, like your guy's age, right? So they... There was 200 logs to make that cabin, and 200 logs cost $2 a log. And they built that cabin in the 50s, and the hand dug it out. And it's three acres, so the county gave it, so we needed to build the substation. The county, we gave them that. We bought that and gave them that. The council did, not and us. And then, they turned around and then they gave us where we could build a substation out of a floodplain, which we got hammered. And then the county said, we'll give it back to you. They did. So the granddaughter put the addition on. And she had bought the house before it got to the county. 
Annie, good friend of mine, Annie Swinderman, good young lady, you know Annie. Of course, we don't. And um, what I think should be done, in my opinion, is that back addition should be ripped off and go back to the original log cabin and preserve it because the has to be sealed, with the wood has to be sealed. The, the rain's getting into that cabin, it's destroying it. I, and I, I think it should be cleaned up a bit, put up the kitchen back in there, nothing fancy. I think it should be available to rent on the bayou for birthday parties for Milltown residents. That's what I think it should be, where people can go and enjoy it. I mean, can't tell you, it used to be when you pulled in, by the log cabin, it used to be all the way around by the borough park and come in between the two ponds and come back out. Well, the one's filled in a little pond. But I just would hate to see that go, go under and be gone. Mm -hmm. I think that's what should be, should be saved. Because how many log, real log cabins are left in the area? And it's got a Milltown story to it. You know, the Swindermans were a taxidermy. I hate to tell you this, you guys are going to laugh, but I'm... I swear I didn't have a drop in a month, I mean, a booze. She, her dog died, and she stuffed it and put it by the mantle. Because <laughs> they were taxidermies. Yeah, and then the, they, the, the, uh, they had a big moose head in there. Every, I said, on the front porch, I go, Mrs. Swinderman, you know, there's a stuffed raccoon, or, and there's a stuffed possum. She goes, oh, let me tell you a story about the possum. And you spend time with the towners, you get lost. So I go, what's the story? She goes, we were just newly married. And she goes, and we're haunting me and my husband. And we're just, and this is like 1920, for God's sake, not even. And I'm out in the woods, and she, he goes, honey, you see, you see, you see the possum? She goes, I see it. She goes, I didn't see a damn thing, Don. But I aimed that gun in the air and I shot it. I didn't see it. And boop, 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 and the possum fell right out of the tree, and he goes, I hit it right between the eyes. We had to stuff that one and put it in, after we ate it, we stuffed it and put it in the foyer. <laughs> I never saw it. <laughs> oh, Andy loves that story. Oh my God, yeah, we, we should save the cabin if we can and, 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 and preserve it for the store. That's a great, that's a great story. The, yeah, the park, it should be part of the park. Absolutely. Uh, be a little more inclusive, but I don't know how we do that with the glass windows and things because the vandalism's going on in there. I don't know how we can light it up. I don't know how we could. I would like to see the fence removed and then people to be able to get in there around the get around that pond and enjoy it more. I think it would be really great. We've actually done a couple Eagle Scout projects around that. Oh, uh, fantastic! So um, we had one Eagle Scout that uh, his project was to put the redo the split rail fencing around the whole pond, uh, and then there was. Uh, paths, cleaning up, ripping out bamboo. Uh, the bamboo's got to go out. Yeah, it's wild. It's, it's not crazy. right. That just runs crazy. It wild. runs amok. That stuff is ten. Is hard to pull out. Well, I want to thank you guys for make starting to make the right move. I, in my opinion, to get that right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were actually supposed to go in and renovate it now what, four years ago, um, and then uh, right before COVID, everything they shut us down with going in there and renovating it and then it got broken into and vandalized uh, before we were able to get in there. I know it's plywooded up with the windows and yeah. Yeah. It's, it was such a, it's a nice place. I, I remember when they lived in there, she lived in there. Yep. Mm -hmm. My father go down, he sold muffins and English muffin, we go down and visit Mrs. Swinderman. We used to go to the parties there. I used to walk from my house as a kid and go to the parties there. <coughs> she was uh, if you ever had an injured bird or whatever, you'd go to Mrs. Swinderman and she'd take care of it. She'd either put it to sleep or she'd fix it. <laughs> and if she didn't do the two of them, she'd eat it. She'd eat squirrels. She had squirrel stew which I tried down there. She was a lot of fun. She was a real woods lady. Him and her. Oh my, they were real, they were the real deal. New and Dutch Mr. oven recipe, guys. Mr. Swinderman, I believe, actually worked for the Smithsonian. No, oh, it's a museum, museum in New York. Oh, I'm sorry, Museum of Natural, Natural History. Yes, yes. his work he did for them. He was the lead taxidermist. His yes, he son did. Bruce took over. Yep. And then his grandson, and then his grand—that was his grandson Bruce. Mm -hmm. Bruce is still alive, but Bruce eventually went blind. Yep. Right. But I'd read meters, 
in 1990 after I got out of the Navy and I get in the back and I love the taxi. What do they, what do they kill? What are they stuffing? What do they got going on back here? And I get in the back. I go, hey, Mr. Swiffer. Hey, Donnie. What's up, boy? Come on in. They had a huge lion from the museum they were renovating. And you stood underneath it and you'd go, my God, I'd probably just pray to this thing. To well, see it up close. He goes, watch it when you go down there by the electric meter. He goes, yeah, I got something exactly. salted up down there. It's, and I go the down there, there's a dead pig or a dead bear down yeah. there. And he's got it all back. Holy crap. I uh, mean, look at this. I, Don, the Nobody's going to believe me. The first time you sent me down there. Yeah. When I was reading meters, I went down there, and you guys didn't tell me what to expect. I, I've seen a couple of horror movies in my life, but they had the big tub. I don't know what the red marks were. I hope it was just, and you know. And the salt put, on the ground? Well, the concrete uh, yeah, ground all that the stuff floor. down there. They had multi-level things. They had these big, like, gappling hooks. And it's, it's like right out of, like, the Munster's house. It was, so it was really <laughs> wet. <wild. laughs> crazy. And then it's all downstairs. I come back up and go, why don't you have a pot of coffee and spend a couple minutes with us, Tom? Yeah. I go, okay, Mr. Swingman, I will. And I'd have a cup of coffee. We'll show you how to do a snake. Or we're doing a bird. And then Bruce, Bruce, Bruce would tell me, Bruce Swingman, he, I got a sense of humor, but sometimes I, I think our town doesn't have a sense of humor. I go, why is that, Bruce? Of course, I fall right into it. Well, we were doing a bear. I said, can I buy that black bear? I want to buy this stuffed black bear. I can't say it, it's a museum piece. So we took the hand of a bear off, and when you skin a bear, I can't be, he's gonna be okay if I tell you this. If we skin a bear, it looks like, and you take the, the skin, the hand looks like a human being. Mm -hmm. So I thought me and my friend would be funny. <laughs> and we went down to Mill Pond, and we laid it down by the pond. <laughs> oh no. And he goes, it wasn't funny. They got all of like somebody got murdered and there was a hand in there. I had to tell him it was a bare hand and my father gave me all holy hell for that. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Is there any more last questions for Mr. Herman? Thank you so much, Don. So let's give Mr. Herman a round of applause. Clothing. You guys, if you stay, just remember the town is only as good as the people that are in it. Yeah, much better than this. And it looks pretty good from where I sit. Thank you for tonight. It was more of a pleasure and an honor for me to be with you guys tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.